Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I am Alec Purcell, the founding host of the podcast. I have been crewing up on sets for over 10 years. I've made dozens of films, shorts, and features, either as a producer or director, and I am just finishing up my first feature film as writer-director at The Alternate. I'm Liz Manischel. I'm a writer, director, producer with two features under my belt as writer, director, producer. I am writing my third question mark feature right now. It's a horror film. Okay. I'm also a former film critic and current distribution consultant. He used to manage the creative distribution initiative at Sundance. This week, we have an interview with producer extraordinaire Andrew Carlberg, who has an insane amount of producer credits and has worked in both film and theater as well. Uh, Andrew has a pretty impressive Rolodex and has a very practical perspective on how to put a project together, which I don't think I've ever really heard anyone break it down so detailed and so like matter of factly before, which was awesome. Um, after the interview, stick around for a short film called A Senseless Act by David DeVoice. Vos? DeVos. I would say De- like Bessie DeVos is what I was guessing. Okay, DeVos. I like it. And if we have time, we'll share some listener, uh, viewer reviews and comments. But without any more talking and jibber jabbering, here is our talk with Andrew. All right, well, Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we get into the actual conversation, let's just talk about Sister of the Groom. Can you give us a quick elevator pitch of this film? Yeah, um, absolutely. It is um, a woman on the eve of her 40th birthday is going to her brother's wedding um, and encountering a sister, a future sister-in-law that she's not too fond of. And it kind of brings up lots of issues of of the past and of of self reflection and and everything that kind of naturally happens um, at your fortieth birthday and maybe even is more accented when you're a woman on her fortieth birthday. Uh, how many days did you shoot? That one, I would have to say, and I don't recall the exact number, but we were probably hovering around like twenty three days, is my guess, and so it's. You know, not the not the slimmest in terms of what all of us have had to do on indie films, but also not the not the biggest. But we were in the twenty to twenty five day range. And uh, what was the rough budget, if you can say? I mean, I really I can't say. It, it's one that grew <laughs> as the movie grew. It was a wedding <laughs> film, and um, that was my first time doing a wedding film. And um, those have enormous enormous expenses that you think you know until you get into it and then we also had like the perfect storm literally and figuratively of everything else that could happen we literally had to like stop for crazy weather in the hamptons which was so out of season until you've dealt with like a hundred extras in white in a rainstorm you really (laughs) haven't lived a movie life (laughs) uh please put a pin on that story i would like to hear it (laughs) Um, uh, how long did you spend working on the film from, you know, its reception to the release? Yeah. So I would say I, in ter- we shot it in 2018 in the, in the fall of 2018, I had probably been with it for actually like less than a year at that point, which is really fast in the world of movie making I feel like so I had come on board earlier that year I had made a film with the filmmaker prior her name is Amy Miller Gross and so this was her her sophomore feature um and but you know we were lucky to be in a place where it was financed and not cast contingent we obviously knew that we needed the best cast to sell and to make this movie and and the the best people for the roles but we weren't having someone breathing down our necks in terms of like Mm -hmm. this hypothetical list that does or does not work you know Mm -hmm. so that made that made us able to actually set a start date stick to that start date and then it was released in in december of of 2020 so you know it was about a two-year process from when it was shot but i would say the editorial process really took a healthy 
year, if not a little bit more. We didn't like rush through editing. And then how big was your crew on that film? I don't know the exact number, but I mean, I I would guess it was between 50 and 100, you know what I mean? That's probably what the crew size was as a whole. It was a union project, and so, um, you know, there's certain standards. It didn't start as a union project, but it sure ended up as a union project. And um, and, uh, and, uh, we definitely have the... um, we had all the, but we already had kind of the standard roles already in place. We didn't really have to expand our crew after that. Mm-hmm. Um, compared to all your other projects that you've made, how difficult was this one? Extraordinarily difficult. It was <laughs> one that tested my limits more than I knew I could be tested. I remember there was like a period of time where I lost like 30 pounds in a month because of stress, which is great. I highly recommend the independent <laughs> film diet. It works wonders. Um, because it was just like, no, it was just, it really was so tough. And I was having to, at the time, against my better judgment, because you really don't know when something's going versus when it's not like what we were, you know, we didn't have our leads really locked in until like the month before uh month of and so it's like i still had other obligations in los angeles the shot in the hands and so i was like balancing both things i was having to go travel you know what i mean and and then pop back for a hot second in la and then go back and you know it was so personally i had a lot on my plate which was my own self doing you know obviously and then like i mentioned the movie itself was a very what i would say a very big a big small movie you know what i mean it was it really had a lot of elements to it and had a lot to um um a lot to to undertake and then we had our own challenges on top of that um i want to take the opportunity to talk about something that we we've heard a little bit about but not a lot of the details but talk about why the movie was non-union yeah. And then how it became union and why it became union. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you've heard so much about like, I'm sure many people know that a, a movie can be flipped. You know what I mean? Like you can start as a non-union project and then become a union project, not really because of your own doing, you know? And so this is, that's what this happened is like, you kind of, and I'll be so diplomatic as we talk about all of this, but it's like, you know, like, we got to a certain size where it was just like people took note of it and it was, it was, it was flipped by the union, you know, and I've done, obviously I've done many union projects as well. And and the goal is always to do that when you can, you know what I mean? If it's of a certain size where you can support all of that, you know? Um, And so, you know, knowing the exact details of how that happened, you know, are a little bit more, more fine. And like, but clearly somebody, somebody made note of it (laughs) i i I know you want to ask a follow-up i know that face sorry please go (laughs) well unless your question is going to be about uh the union not about unions okay well here i guess so is is it really just like the the budget growing and the crew size growing and then the union noticing and then they're like oh wait you need to have teamsters you need to have blah blah you need to do all this stuff yeah and i mean obviously there's not like a hard and fast rule where it's just like you have to have it kind of like is different project to project. And and like I said, we were already in a place where our rates were already very, you know, we didn't have to change the rates on things. We didn't have to like, cause we were already like doing all that. So like, but you know, really the big thing that you have, I would say the biggest hit to your budget that happens when that happens, you have to pay all the pension and health and the fringes that go along with, with the union. But yeah, it's usually that you grow to a certain size where there's money to be made on, on that. Damn crazy that sucks though i mean like it's a challenge not- but we're very we were very fortunate that we were able to accommodate that as well you know i mean it was not easy to do and it was it definitely took adjustments and we had to shut down briefly and restart it wasn't just like you know like I and mean, we're talking like shut down for a day or two you know what i mean like to like reacclimate the world but um it's not a pleasant experience but um but it's one that many people have encountered you know especially when you're in the world of a movie that is let's say like low like hovering around the six figure place and 
you know, and like I said, it's possibly growing or that you have name actors come on board and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to ask, it's a very specific question, Andrew, I'm so sorry. But like when you're planning a wedding, you get upcharged X, mil you know, times a million. And then when you're uh, working with vendors for a film, you also get upcharged <laughs> like times a million. So I'm just curious, like in terms of relationship with vendors and everything that goes into planning a film, was it as expensive as a wedding? Like how did you, I mean, I know you didn't do the negotiations, but you know. What's your vantage point? We had an amazing production designer. Her name is Eve McCarney, and she really just moved mountains and stuff. So, I mean, she was our wedding planner. And then, and then in addition to that, our director has such a keen eye for, for, for production design and style and stuff like that, too. So combined, you know, it really like we we didn't need the wedding planner per se, you know what I mean? We had it all in our team. I mean, it's expensive just because you want, it has to look expensive. You know, I think that's the thing that like is hard to say is like, you're like certain movies you, you make like have to look cheap or have to like the world has to look, you know, run down or has to do this or whatever that is. Whereas this is a movie that has to look, a wedding in the Hamptons it has to look a certain way and that look costs money you know so that's that's where I think the money versus like being upcharged necessarily I don't think it necessarily that they would upcharge as if it was just a wedding um and um but but yeah we definitely had our work cut out for us mm. Mm. I'm really interested to hear because you mentioned that this was this this um, director's second film and that you produced the, her, their first film as well. Um, how did the second film ha come to be? Was it like, you know, they went out and raised a bunch of money and like, you know, did that on their own. And then when the money was raised, came to you and like, OK, I'm ready to make this movie. Like, did you help get the money for the film to come together? Like, how did that process happen? So just in general, with with the way I work is there. I mean, I come on to a project in all different capacities you know what i mean like at various project to project so there's times where i come on board where something is a kernel of an idea and i'm there the whole way there's times where i do help raise money there's times where it's a finance project and i'm for lack of a better term a producer for hire you know that doesn't change my passion on the content um or or the the content of the script i should say i know we don't we don't say content anymore they're films they're movies um, art I know exactly. Um, so, but um, but with this particular one, the director had ties to ties to the financing, and so that was. But I wasn't like necessarily on. I was on board before it was like it's an, a go movie. I would say you know, like definitely when we were continuing to develop it some more, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But then, but I didn't have to raise money for this particular movie. Let's go back in time a little bit. So you and I met at Sundance when um, I had talked with your pro uh, talked. We would considered lady ladylike for our fellowship, and I remember we were walking around the Sundance building. And um, what <laughs> and what struck me like why would we walk outside? <laughs> yeah. um, and. Uh, you know, a, a lot of things obviously struck me, struck me that are wonderful and positive about you. But the thing that stands out in my mind is your relationship to talent. And that's why I always bug you when I'm trying to find someone. Um, can you talk a little bit about your work in the world of the theater and also how you've cultivated relationship with, with um, name talent? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I come from the theater. I love it. I've worked in Los Angeles and New York around the world in, in theater um, and it's a, a place, I mean, I think it's like a place where organically so many great stories grow and it's, it's the actor's medium. I mean, that's really what it is. It's like, if, you know, like I, they kind of say, and I, it's evolved and changed, but like if, if theater's the actor's medium, film is a director's medium, television's a producer's medium. That seems to be where the like overarching kind of, feelings lie but so it's just like you see actors in their purest form there and i've and i've done so much work in theater that has been i don't want to say quick work but like i did a show for a long time for instance called the blind day project that was an improv based show we had a new guest actor every week you know what i mean and we got to 
by the end of that the run of that show we were having huge guest actors and then so many staged readings and benefits and stuff so you meet talent quickly when that happens and then when you're when you have a good project and you're knock on wood fun to work with like people recommend you know recommend you and so and so the ball starts rolling down the hill where you start actors start introducing you to other actors and then you're just like i have so many actors in my life you know um, but i also really love that too i'm very passionate about the work that they do and very appreciative of what they bring to the table as partners um so that's one reason i've also worked so much with actor hyphenates actors turn directors actors turn producers um and i love i love that part of my my career as well but um but yeah that's a, the the nutshell version of that and then even though you have such deep relationships with talent do you still work with a casting director on your projects Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, it, it varies when you bring them in. Obviously, if we're doing attachments, like to maybe get a movie going, I might do that, you know, on my own, um, um, depending on, on what the project is, if there's development funds or not, you know, all that kind of stuff. But absolutely, once the once, once the project is moving forward, um, a casting director is crucial and I've worked with so many great ones and there's so many I want to work with. Um, they're such an amazing part of, in, in, of the puzzle. Okay. So the second part of the theater question is why film? Why the transition to film? If you're directly moving into quote unquote, a director's medium, what, it, what do you, uh, what joy do you drive out of it? Right. And I mean, and, and, and like I said, I would say I started, even though I come from theater, it's just, I would say like from when I was young to but like as my professional career developed, you know, um, I actually, as my professional career started in TV, but I think, I mean, I love all the mediums, you know, and they all allow for something different um, or something similar. I don't know if you watched the Golden Globes last night, but like Tina and Amy were like joking that there's so many like play to film out at it. They're called pluvies, <laughs> you know, Ma Rainey and One Night in Miami. They're pluvies that are um, that are um, up for awards this year. Um, so plays that are on film, but um, but I think that uh, different um, different opportunities, you know. And I think that as long as you're aware of the space you're playing in, but I really love, I love them all for different reasons. So, I mean, I'm just looking at your IMDb credit list. You've got 48 credits as a producer. Holy Toledo, that is a lot of movies. Um, but the thing that really strikes me <laughs> about it <laughs> is it's it's a big mix of shorts and features. It's not just like a lot of people. I should try to watch <laughs> some of these films. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, the question is, wait, wait, like, that's a whole lot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why like what keeps on drawing you back to shorts because normally you see people start with shorts and then they get to features and then they just sure. live in the future realm I but why do you keep on I, yeah I can't tell you how much I love the short form medium I mean I really appreciate it and and I mean truly love it I mean not only because it's even before skin that medium had, has done so well for me in the past, you know, whether that's just in terms of festival exposure, introducing me to a director that I then went on to produce a feature for them that was directly related to that short or just tonally the short was a great proof of concept of what we were able to accomplish together. But I think that, you know, with a short, you can, you have to be concise and you have to tell your story and eat you know, 18 to 25 minutes, if not less, you know, you have to really know what you want to say and say it well, you know, a short that I have that's um, in consideration for the Academy Award right now, that's shortlisted is called Feeling Through and both Feeling Through and Skin, I feel like have, while they're completely different in, in their execution and in their story, the one thing that they both have in common is they do not waste a single second screen time you know every moment is so purposefully utilized to advance the story and that's something that you don't always have the option to do in a feature film you know another one of my frequent collaborators is this filmmaker named Dekel Berenson who also loves the short film medium um greatly and he's like because like he's like if you think of it like 
like literature or something he's like i think you can make a perfect poem but i don't know if you can actually write a perfect novel mm-hmm. and that's kind of his attitude about a short versus feature i don't know if it's actually possible to make a perfect feature but you can sure make a perfect short well, considering the large number of credits, like how do you know you want to jump on that project? Is it that script stage? Is that the most vital thing? Or uh, instead of me answering the question for you, I'll just let you talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it really just depends. I mean, there's plenty of projects where I come on board after or during something, you know, whether it's they like need help finishing something, whether it's getting it out there into the world, obviously. You, you tend to be most intricately involved when something is is at its inception point. But it really comes down to if I believe in the story and if I believe in the filmmaker. And those do go hand in hand because you're creating a marriage with that person that you're going to be with for a long time. You know, it's so funny. Like one of the, like the um, professional, like pr- one of the personal accountants of one of my, filmmakers was asking for you know 1099s and something from a from a film and he made some comment and he's just like oh well we need your 1099 i was like i haven't been paid on this film in like two years you know what i mean three years he's like what do you mean you're doing this all for free i was like well no i got paid on the project but like i'm in it for life now it's not like i'm on my like, retainer for life though you know and he was just shocked you know and i was like no it's like you create a marriage with these people and you're a part of that project forever you know um but um but yeah, I think that really it's just, is, is it something that excites me? I also like doing things I haven't done before. You know, a lot of times if something, um, you know, allows me, that's one thing that I loved about Skin. It's not only that I love the script, but there were so many elements between special effects, special effects makeup, working with kids, working with weapons, working with uh, with animals, drones like i was like oh i'm gonna have to flex every muscle possible you know during this and that's going to be such a great experience to do um so that's another thing that really pushes me and then by all means like you can look at my i always say that like i want to be able to look at my mvb and at least be able to tell somebody why i did a certain project but like oh this was an investment in my future because of this person was involved or yeah they paid me and i can just flout like that was the reason i did that one <laughs> Um, going back to the shorts, like how, how do you raise money for a short film? And, and like, cause you can't really make very much money on a short sure. film. Obviously. No, it's not a lucrative industry at all. And in, <laughs> even at the highest level, you're not making a ton of money on, on shorts by any means, but you, like I said, but it pays off in other ways because the amount of work you get as a result of a great short as, is, is, is it's limitless, you know, um, but in turn, usually the shorts come, the shorts are a director driven medium as well, you know, so it's like usually that comes, the director comes with, with the financing or the ability to bring financing to a short, like whether that's obviously a lot of people crowdfund, I'm not a big fan of crowdfunding, I'm down for people to raise money through their colleagues, 100%, I think that crowdfunding itself has become a somewhat plateaued um endeavor in terms of the traditional way of doing that um but i also but yeah i think that whether it's savings whether it's asking selling off ep credits you know what i mean people want to get involved and if you if you have a short that's special and has special people involved you know there are people with money that absolutely want to be involved in movies Oh, wait, can you go into more about the crowdfunding thing? I, I feel like you uh, shortchanged us. Money pun. <laughs> uh, I just think that, like, you know, if somebody's putting a Kickstarter on Facebook, I am very unlikely to just donate because I saw something on my Facebook page that someone put out. Whereas if Liz emailed me directly and said like, Hey, can you put a hundred dollars into this short film? And it was like, and we have a PayPal account and it's like this, and this is what it's going for. I probably would do it. You know what I mean? Like, but like, but, but if I'm just seeing a general mass non-specific email you know versus a personalized outreach and it's still a different type of crowdfunding she's still reaching out to her colleagues you're going to get money from the people you know already it's not like random people are really giving so like do a little bit of the extra legwork reach out to people directly and it's also harder for them to say no well what if you were to get that email with a link to the crowdfunding (laughs) 
thing because that because that's basically what because and, that, and i do it. that too so i mean i do that too it really just comes down to how much i like the person no i'm just kidding um <laughs> oh, it does i think it does if you sure. like that person yeah no so i mean i think it's just more like i said like i think that there's a very fine line because like as a producer your job is to help get this movie made and so like if people are all the time putting an SOS out on Facebook, that's like, I need this. I need like, that's not really producing. It's like, who is your, who are your relationships? How do you utilize those relationships? Who's the best person? Yes. Maybe you don't know somebody that's skilled in whatever field you're like, you need an armor because you need to do like use a prop gun or something like that. And it's like, then and you may not know that, but you know people that have worked with those people. So reach out to those people. Like I said, don't just advertise everything for everybody to do your work. I think that's an, a really interesting perspective, and I don't hear that a lot because I actually do exactly what you're saying I shouldn't do. Um, and I think I do it in part out of, I think there's a degree of laziness, and I think you're, you're acknowledging that too because crowdsourcing is not strategic, right? When you're just like throwing it out to the wild and also you're betraying a little bit about your lack of organization as an that, individual. That said though, <laughs> I have to check myself. Like, I mean, there's times where I'd be like, I want somebody to, I want to do this. And I'm like, no, no, you, you don't do this, Andrew. Like, this is not the way, you know what I, like every day I wake up and I want to be like, who knows where I can get a vaccine? You know what I mean? It's just like, tell me, people. I'm ready to drive. But I'm like, no, you can Google. You can look around. You can do your work. Oh, that's funny. Um, so I want to hear more about, like, when you get involved in a movie early stage and, like, what your process is to getting that movie like to happen and to come alive. Like, I mean, do you, do you immediately look for partners? Are you trying to find a production company to do a co-production with? Or are you going out to a list of people that you know who might might be interested in, you know, like funding or helping fund the film? I like, mean, I usually don't start with financing. Usually I start with like, how can I start making this the best package it can possibly be so that like I can get the most money for this project. You know, if I come at it with just the script, you know, I likely, and even if it's a great script, I might get the bare minimum that that script needs to go forward. Where if I come in with two actors as well, you know, I might get a million more than I need, you know, as the bare minimum. And then people can be paid much more healthily. Um, it, but it really does, it just varies with the story and the genre. And I mean, there's, I wish there was an easy way to say it, but like usually, like, I would say the first thing upon reading and I mean, I guess let's assume that there's a director in place. If there's not a director in place, that's 100% always the first place to start is getting the director before financing, before any of that, you know, it's find the right filmmaker for this movie. Um, and then if it's the, the type of movie that has roles that can be packaged, you know, obviously depending on the, how, the nature of the ensemble you know what i mean if there's standout roles or not you know and and if if there's clear roles where you can put a star um you would start maybe going that route i mean in terms of finding partners yeah there's a lot of times where i have partners a lot of times where people are already involved and then i would say also getting you know agency support you know going out to the agents that i work with best and and getting covered at 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 the big, you know, big four or five, um, and creating internal support too, so that when I need to then make the big offers, um, I have somebody on the inside that's also on my side. Oh my, oh my God, God, I have like 45, 45 questions, questions about, about that. Uh, <laughs> when you say getting, getting covered, can, can you unpack, unpack that, that a little bit? bit? Yeah, I mean, it's just like, I mean, it's getting an agency to like have somebody internally that reads the script as an assigned to that script so that like, you know, if I have a list of UTA clients that I'm wanting to know if they're available and if they're, if it's realistic with all that kind of stuff that I can go to that person and, and they can do the internal work and you can be like, listen, um, I know you want Meryl Streep for your hundred thousand dollar movie, but that's probably not a good idea right now, you know, given what she's doing. And I'll be like, okay, fine. You know, <laughs> 
and then how do you how do you get that kind of support from an agency? Is it like you have to have the relationships, or do you have a certain budget that you have to like say, oh, this is going to be? I don't million. really think it's tied to the budget. I mean, if it's a good project, you know what I mean that they want to support. If obviously, if there's a client already involved in some capacity, they become more passionate about handling it. But it's like, no, it's really it's just about like. Hi, having hired clients of that agency in the past, knowing that you have a track record for getting things made. I, I 100% understand the catch 22 to all of this. It's just like, well, how do you start if you need, it's like, but you know, that's why I like it just like work begets other work is all I can say. So you have relationships with talent, but you also have relationships with agencies. So I'm curious when you're, um, assisting in terms of attaching talent in that capacity, do you go to the talent first or do you go to the agency first? Depends how well I know the talent. You know what I mean? Um, if it's a very close friend, you know, I'll I'll reach out to them first. You know what I mean? Or I might reach out to say like, hey, what are, you, are you even available right now? Where, when does your show finish shooting? Whatever that is. And then it's some, if we're looking to formalize something, I, I will go to the agency as well for sure. And then when you have this package together, which I'm assuming is actors and director, or are there more pieces to the package that make it better? I mean, obviously, those are the key the key components, but you might have a name executive producer that you want to bring on board. You know what I mean? That, um, that is um, a valuable asset. Obviously, you know, per, um, cinematographers and editors can have a certain amount of cachet as well mm. you know um you don't always bring them on necessarily for that point but if you have you know a, a giant one that's definitely worth noting and can be just as attractive as one especially in the cinematographer world because they're working directly with the actors so with that package like do you have like a rolodex of people that you immediately start hitting up to see if they want to take a look at it or is there another process you go through in, in, order in terms to of find... agencies or in terms of everything in terms of in terms of financing like once the project the package is together yeah i mean like i i have you know i have my list of both financiers i've gone to in the past obviously i have people in my world but then you know i also like you know take into account what the nature of this movie is and it's like you know if if I were making a thriller, there are very clear avenues for people that are, that play in that space. Um, and then like I said, if I'm also working with an agency partner they have, they, they're very on top of who's, who's actively financing and stuff like that too. You know, I work in distribution and in my vantage point, a lot of films do not recoup or indefinitely a lot of films do not profit. I mean, but I would love to hear, and, I, and, and by the way, my you know mantra is that the system is broken. Uh, that being said, uh, do you do you f feel from your vantage point that filmmakers are not, and when I say filmmakers, I mean producers and directors, are not leading sustainable lifestyles? Or do you feel like you've managed to kind of cull together enough work that your lifestyle could be replicable for other producers? And it's interesting that you say, you know, that they don't recoup somebody is making money or else right, this business someone. would not exist. <laughs> right. So it's well, the rights owner, the rights owners are not. Yeah, exactly. Whether that filters down to the filmmaking team, that's the real question. And distributors are clearly making money. And so um, in terms, of, I do lead, lead a sustainable life that's taken time to happen you know i started my career working developing and working on the television show castle on abc and i left like at four and a half seasons i had set up my first feature and i left to make my first feature and i can't tell you how many times that first year that I was like why did i leave a hit television show to go make an independent movie like where like my bank account was not cute i remember like when christmas <laughs> like cashing like all the b savings bonds i had received like over the year from my great aunt like you know what i mean like for my birthday and my dad's like you know you have to pay taxes on those and i was like what the fuck are you talking about I have to pay taxes on this you know and i was just like i was like that's not part of my plan and so um <laughs> But, but like I said, once everything starts moving, you know, like I said, work begets other work. And I mean, I, but I'm not purely, I am not purely a film producer. If I, if you were like, can you make your movie just doing independent or can you make your living just doing independent films? Yeah, you absolutely can. But that's very challenging to do at the level that you would want to do it if you're not fully employed by one company, you know, um, 
but I have a lot of aspects to my producing work. You know, I consult a lot, you know, um, I produce theater, which is also just so lucrative. I can't even tell you <laughs> how lucrative theater is. Yeah. No, but, but it is a part of my, a part of my income. I produce events for a lot of nonprofits and stuff too, which are major fundraising events. Um, so I have a, I have a lot of different, and I have had, I've been lucky enough to continue to dabble in TV, which does pay, you know? Um, so when you put all of that together, you know, I, I have a, a, a nice, a nice, nice set of life, but still, you know, piecing it together, like every year looks different, you know? Um, and so, and so that's just something to, to take into account. But the other thing is I don't, I mean, and I'm in a, I'm very aware that I'm in a, place of of luxury to be able to say this but i don't work for free i don't i just don't not even on shorts you know what i mean so it's like i've but i but i've have the ability to say no you know what i mean and that's something that like not i truly get that not everybody is at that place yet and definitely when i started i worked for way less than i do now and i get that that's how part of the process in, in building up your credits like what are you looking for in a script and not even looking for i guess the better question is how do you find your scripts like i mean are you reading scripts like weekly like going through 10 scripts like do you just i get through- i i have an embarrassing amount of number in my ipad that have not been read yet my favorite is when a movie comes out and i'm like oh i was supposed to read that and like <laughs> you know and i was just like oh that that's not gonna happen now um but um one less script though that's great you could delete it yeah, yeah, exactly. That's one off the, the chain. But especially also, like I says, when you do TV, film, and theater, like you get sent tons from all different aspects. But no, I get sent stuff from major agents and managers. I get sent stuff from my collaborators. I seek out stuff. I, I develop stuff. So it's a combination of all of it. Like, and would you read something from someone you don't know if they sent it to you directly? Or does it always have to come through a source of someone that you know? Mm, it depends i mean i usually don't go with unsolicited material but you know what like i try to at least respond to everybody that reaches out like obviously there's people that reach out through all different methods now you know um i at least try to respond to something that's like oh i i can't take on unsolicited material this but it's like if something catches my eye or i'm like you know like i mean i'll there's times where you catch me at the right moment you know but the thing is is also there is no reason for me to receive something from someone I don't know now, because like Facebook ex- literally tells you everybody that you can know in common with somebody, you know what I mean? So all you have to do, and I'm at my Facebook threshold. I don't even know half of these people I feel like. So it's like, you can find some way to get to me. I'm sure there's somebody that has a connection. <laughs> uh, I'm asking a question that I don't know if it has an answer. Uh, is there a common thread amongst the people that you work with of mistakes? Like, have you seen just filmmakers make the same error over and over again? Could you speak to, like, if you could tell a filmmaker um, to stop doing something, could you? And what would it be? This is not this is not with the people that I work with, per se, but I think it's a greater perception that maybe exists. I think that, like... And I and I and I mean this as nuanced as possible. I think people think like sometimes the producer is the enemy. Like the producer just wants you to do it for less, to do it faster. And it's like, but like in reality, like you making the best movie you can make is the best thing for me too. You know what I mean? We have the same end goal, and there's nothing that makes me happier than when it all works out. You know what I mean? And and when and I get the same joy from your excitement of attaching a certain actor or getting into a certain festival or getting a certain offer or getting a certain award or whatever it is that is validating to you, I find equally validating for me and that your excitement I share, you know? So like, I mean, and that's one thing about me as well is like, I'm not saying that I don't have a story in me as a writer or director at some point, but that's not really my end goal. My end goal is producing, you know? So I like making you look the best that you can and us making the best movie is my absolute end game. I love that. Yeah. 
that's that's pretty mm-hmm. amazing. So like I said, if but if but if you go in looking to your, looking at your producers adversarially, and there's definitely directors I've worked with that do that. They come in and just inherently think that the producer is on the other side of the team. That's not the case at all. It's too hard. It's too much work for too little money for that to be the case. Well, and I think a part of that is the way that culturally directors are just lifted up and exalted as these mystical creatures. And then producers are just thought of as like calculators or something. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it's but I think there we are trying to evolve that definition of producer like Sundance has the creative producing lab and creative producing program. And then Rebecca Green has Dear Producer. I just that's why I use the term filmmaker for both because I can't stand when people just kind of like marginalize producer. Sorry, I'm on a soapbox. I just I 100 percent agree with what you're saying. But that's and at the same time, it's like I also see the like you look around at producers and you're like, do you secretly want to be an actor? Why are you making yourself <laughs> the star? You know what I mean? And that that's not the answer either. So I wanted to hear a little bit about like what is the challenge, most challenging part of putting a film together? So like, you know, you talk about the packaging, you talk about all the things that you do when you're trying to get it made, but like, what are some of the biggest roadblocks to like that movie not becoming an actual movie or not happening or whatever? Um, I would say scheduling is a giant part of it, especially when you're working with people that are in demand, like, you know, the, the idea that all the people will come together at the right time obviously money is a huge part like until the cameras are actually rolling you know and it's, it's, until the money is actually in the bank i never believe any movie is going to happen um <laughs> so i think those are are two giant obstacles that are always are always facing you and i think the other is like some people's lack of imagination i have a i'm not going to go into names but i have a very well known um female actor attached to a, an adult drama and she really made her name for herself more in the action space i would say and there are a lot of financiers and she, she's an amazing actress there are a lot of financiers that cannot wrap their head around this person doing adult drama and like whereas if i had her kicking butt it probably would have been financed in a day I want to go to the final five questions. So Ulrich, I know that you have more. So jump in. Keep Go for it. I, this is like a question that's sort of like wrapped in like three questions. But um, basically, <laughs> I want to know about like the back end situation with you. Like, you know, you, you say you get paid for all your movies, but are you receiving back end um, money from the films? that? that I mean, I usually have money? points on a project. It depends on the nature of the project obviously not shorts are not necessarily like we said like something that are structured the same way that features are by any means but yeah i usually have some sort of back-end participation so like across like 47 movies or 48 movies or whatever however many are movies like are you getting checks from these are you making no, i mean it on- varies usually like you know obviously like things taper off you know what i mean like you like maybe have a first sale and then and then something will will get smaller over time it just depends on the nature of that movie and what the sale is and obviously streamers play a different role in this stuff because like streamers you're not seeing if you're if you're licensed in perpetuity to a streamer you're not seeing consistent revenue from that streamer it's if you're licensing you know and then once your license with Amazon is done, you license to Hulu and then you license, then you can, you know, kind of re up things. But it, it truly just depends on the project. But I'm not like living on residuals. I don't have like friends and Seinfeld money coming into me or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the other part of the question was like going to genre. Does does that play a role in like what films you want to take on? Or it, it seems like you kind of work across all genres. Yeah, I consider myself fairly genre blind. A good story is a good story, you know. I mean, there's definitely things that, it, and I mean, it kind of falls in line with, as you can imagine, like what you naturally gravitate towards watching is what you kind of gravitate towards wanting to make, you know. So there's certain genres that I'm less enthusiastic about, but I by no means would would cross them off the list wait wait i have a final question it just came to me um so i said that i feel that filmmakers are not recouping at least you know like the llc you know is not recouping um how do you feel from your vantage point yeah i mean i like i said i think 
everyone is completely unique. I think you have to make something very economically for it to, to make its money back. And I mean, I mean, any investment in the, unless you are pre-selling your movie, you know what I mean? With huge names to the world, anybody who invests in the arts and that's anybody that invests in any aspect of the arts needs to be prepared to lose their money. That's just what it is. Never invest what you can't afford to lose. That's just like, rule number one that said your investment might come with many other reasons to invest whether that's getting your name on the project whether that's writing something off on your taxes whether that's you know there's a million other reasons that can be lucrative and just and also to know just because something doesn't immediately recoup in full doesn't mean that you're not seeing any money from it you know what i mean and so that's like important to know too and that like we live in a world where things are continually being rediscovered and and re and and re found out like you know it takes like something will be trending on netflix and you're like yeah that movie was 10 years old but like it never found its audience then you know wow final All right. five final, final five. five absolutely i saw start this time um what's the first film you ever made and how do you feel about it now the first We'll go with the first feature I made um, was a movie called Some Girls, and it was written by Neil Butte and directed by Daisy Mayer. Um, and it, I adore it. It was a it was a hard project, and there were challenges to that as well. But I mean, it was a cast that, that was to die for: Adam Brody, Kristen Bell, Jennifer Morrison, Zoe Kazan, Mia Maestro, Emily Watson. Um, premiered at South by Southwest in the narrative spotlight um i i really i love that movie and i have lifelong friends from that movie and um i haven't watched it recently but uh my memories are fond (laughs) what's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received um the best filmmaking response i received um and this is you know not necessarily just to for a director, but let's just say like a decision that the final decision maker, you know, in the, in the spirit of collaboration is Ron Howard told me that like, you know, the best idea wins, but it's not a democracy. It's not like everybody can have equal say on everything, but you absolutely should listen to everybody and make sure that you make the best decision. Um, Do you have a goal as a filmmaker? Um, in terms of like long term, I mean, I would like to be a game changer in some capacity and I don't know in what way that is. And that's not just by making a movie that changes the game or like, cause I don't want to just check off boxes of indie films for my entire life or even studio films. You know, I want to in some way reimagine how some aspect of this is done, you know, um, and change it for the better. Uh, we should talk after the recording. Uh, if you could go back in time, what's the one piece of advice you would give yourself? Um, to say no more. There are t- and I kind of referenced that at the beginning that like I had when I was making Sister of the Groom, I had like a project in LA that was also taking time and like, you know, and obviously you don't know when things are gonna go and all that kind of stuff. But to do your best work, you do have to allow yourself to focus. I I'm a very good multitasker and sometimes I overestimate how good of a multitasker I am. And then I, you know, want to cry in a ball. And then final question is making movies hard. Um, no, there, it's quite simply the easiest thing. No, of, yeah, of course it's difficult, but all good things are difficult. Nothing, nothing worth doing is easy. Um, so they're extremely hard to make, but they also like f- fulfill such a, an, an amazing, amazing part of culture. You know, they are something that everybody, um, everybody gets to be a part of and gets to experience. And it's such a communal, communal activity. It, while movie theaters have been shut down, and obviously we've been seeing how it's affected that community in that way, but it's like, it's it's amazing to think of how much we i every every other day i talk to my mom about something she has watched with my dad you know what i mean and whether it's something they just stumbled on you know on 
on on Netflix or whether it's something they consciously sat down and watched Nomad Land together. It's something to talk about and it's and it and it elicits feelings. Thank you for being on the show. <laughs> thank you guys for having me. Um, thank you. It was a great time. So where should people go if they want to learn more about you and watch your films or do you have a website, Twitter? Uh, Instagram and Twitter. I mean, I, I kind of like post on Instagram and let it filter out to the other social media. So maybe Instagram is a good source point at Andrew Carlberg. Awesome. Yay! Wow. Great. The only thing I really remember, because I took it weirdly personally, as per usual, is him talking about crowdfunding. Because he oh, it was yeah. so funny. Remember, we were like, what do you think about crowdfunding? And he's like, well, let's say Liz ran a campaign. And like, he used me as his like hypothetical situation. And he was saying how he, it was something about how he didn't appreciate or didn't love the spamming of individuals through crowdfunding, mm -hmm. right? It was like this mm -hmm. like impersonal, impersonal mass marketing that happens that he thought was like counterintuitive. I think it's because he's so thoughtful and substantive when he puts together a project that it seems like too haphazard to crowdsource and crowdfund for him. I remember he had a very specific stance about that. Yeah, I think for him, it was like he just didn't understand. And I've had other friends say this. like They don't understand why anybody would give to a crowdfunding campaign for someone they didn't know or who they would already support otherwise, you know. And I think it's like it's just a disconnect between that type of person and the type of person who would, you know, or who wants to. And I think, you know, it's like he kind of made – like his point sort of is what crowdfunding is mainly. And like you are going after people that you, you want to support you, who you know would support you, you know, in a big part of it. It's like the extra people who you don't know, that's like bonus cream. But like I would say – what like 60 to 70 percent of a crowdfunding campaign is probably from people that you know minimum minimum but i have to say yeah. like and i'm i've been such a convert for crowdfunding ever since my first campaign because a stranger a literal stranger who found me because a friend of mine tweeted the campaign and i think i mentioned this to you before he held a garage sale for our film <laughs> And I and like I don't know this guy, and I will. And for me, that was like, oh, I can't be a hundred percent a misanthrope anymore because this random stranger did something so kind. Like it made me see the value and generosity in people I've never met yet. So, yeah, I mean, it's frustrating and it feels untargeted sometimes. But I do think crowdfunding lets you see humanity every now and then. Yeah, I mean, I've met one collaborator who I've made multiple projects with through yeah. crowdfunding. So like she backed one of my, my first short film that I put on crowd on Kickstarter um, and was our biggest backer, by the way. And then, yeah, we've worked together now three times um, and we might work together again, you know? So it's like one of those things that, yeah, that's how we met was through my crowdfunding campaign and I would never have met her otherwise probably. So it's like, it's interesting. There's probably more examples of people like that, you know? Yeah. Um, but anyways, I don't know. I mean, I think to each his own. I mean, if you've got a system that works, like don't break the system, I guess, you know? But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like crowdfunding, it's very tricky. And I feel like you gotta, you gotta approach it <laughs> a certain way, you know? And if you come into it with that sort of mindset of like, yes, this is a job. This is going to be like a lot of work. Like I'm going to treat it like it's a full-time thing that I have to focus on. Then I think... You know that's probably the best way to look at it. But if you're looking at like, oh, I'll just throw it up on crowdfunding and we'll see what happens. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of this guy who ran this crowdfunding campaign a few years ago. I'm not going to call him out, but um, I don't know. I don't know if he listens. But he just posted the link to his Kickstarter campaign maybe once a day, and then he wouldn't. He might say something like, "My crowdfunding campaign," or give to my crowdfunding campaign <laughs> like with a period at the end of it too like not even exclamation point and it was like wow. this textbook example of like this is not how to crowdfund you don't just like throw <laughs> it out into the ether and expect something to come back it's not going to go viral accidentally you know it's like it shows that it's like there's so much work um as we all know and you talked about it a lot in our um in our chat about the uh me me and my, my monster, monster and I, and I. me my mom yeah. my monster and I campaign which we um supported it will be two weeks ago by the time this episode mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and it still will be out, so you can still support that movie if you want to. So check it out and see what you think. Um, But yeah, but Liz, anyways, any other last words to say about Andrew, or should we go to Get Shorty? So you make movies, huh? I produce feature motion pictures. I got an idea for a movie. Hey there, it's Dave DeVos. I am the writer-director of A Senseless Act, this three-minute short film that I am so happy to have on your show today. And if you haven't checked it out yet, you can go on my website and see it. My website is DeVos Entertainment. That's D is in David, E, V is in Victor, O, S is in Sam, DeVosEntertainment.com. You can check out A Senseless Act and a whole bunch of other projects that we've done on that website as well. But this particular movie, A Senseless Act, it's a three-minute short film that was done as part of the TV show On the Lot for Steven Spielberg back in the day. I was invited to be among the top 100 contestants to be on the show. And as part of that, they gave us one week to make a movie. Three minutes, start to finish. I went into their office, they gave me a log line, something important is lost. And we had exactly 168 hours to write it, produce it, direct it, post-produce it, get the whole thing ready and turned in to their office by the deadline, Friday at five o'clock. And so we worked like crazy to come up with this idea. And this was based on a short idea that a friend of mine had told me a while back. It was actually a true story that happened to him about what happened when he lost his wallet in a gas station and the confrontation that he had with the man who took it. And this was a perfect idea to be able to craft in three minutes. And there is a bit of a twist to this movie, so I don't want to give away any spoilers. You got to go check out the film. But casting was our our biggest challenge on this movie. And you'll see when you see the film why our, our most critical actor, we just had to find somebody who was completely authentic in this role. And that was really difficult, especially on the schedule that we were on. And we also had a child actor in the film. And this was difficult because we were shooting nights. And this kid had to be totally natural. And so I actually had a couple of friends, writers and actors, who had a son who was also getting into the business. He was very young, though. He was probably only about four years old, maybe five at the time. But he was so natural because he'd been around it growing up. And so we made it a game for him. We actually gave him this sound game that he played with in the back of the car. And while he was caught up in his own version of playing with this, we shot a whole bunch of footage with him. And I would feed him a couple of lines and I would tell him to push this button or that button and it would make a sound and then he would repeat the sound. So we shot a whole bunch of stuff like that. And then in the edit, we actually crafted part of the story around his reactions to that game. And you'll see when you watch the film why that's so important. So the the funding for this came about when I approached a a mentor of mine, told him what was happening. I was super excited about it. He was a very big supporter of my career, and he agreed to write the check for the entire production. Now, it wasn't that expensive because I pulled in a ton of favors from cast and crew, but still, we had a lot of hard costs. Now, in terms of what this has done for my career, it didn't launch me to the big studio level. I think a film like this is very intimate and it's very moving, but it is so relevant even for today and the kind of culture that we're having today and the kind of conversation that we're having today. And this film has stayed so relevant and it is so important in the conversations that we're having about race and prejudice and all the kinds of things that are happening in our society today are are very much ingrained in this movie. And so I think it still has a lot to say to us, even though it was made a few years ago, I think some of the underlying issues that are being addressed in this movie are very, very relevant for today. So I was very, very proud to be part of this film. And actually we've gone on to make other films, Eyes to See, A Champion Heart. Uh, There are a number of projects that we've done that are also inspirational that really hope to, I hope to move people with them and give them a, 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 a look at life as it could be. So I'm really excited. I'm glad to be able to share this with your listeners. Thank you guys for inviting me on this show. And again, if you want to see A Senseless Act, which won Best Drama at the Santa Monica Film Festival, you can go to my website at devosentertainment.com. Guys, I really appreciate you having me on the show. I know how hard it is to make movies, so I'm glad that you're out there encouraging everybody. And yes, making movies is hard, but it can be done. You just gotta make the decision to go do it, to lean into it, to commit to it, to gather friends and family and a community of people that believe in you and that you can support in return and just go do it. Go get your dreams. I'll talk to you soon. 
<laughs> hey, Arik, what did you think of A Senseless Act by David DeVos? So, Senseless Act, interesting. Well, you know, I, this was the top of, of the, um, you know, the submission list, and I, you know, watched it mainly because it was three minutes long or four minutes long or whatever. Um, and I was like, oh, this is easy, done. Let's see what this one, if this one's any good. Um, and, uh, you know, I think overall, I thought the production value was really good and really solid. I thought the kid was really good. And I, I, it's like one of the things about kid actors, it's like you don't need to have them do too much. Like you can just do it simply and just have them be a part of the scene and sort of integrate them as needed. But I think the one or two lines a kid did have were like perfectly done. And I think doing kid acting, it's like so hard to get a good performance out of a kid, and especially one that's like an authentic looking kid and not a kid actor kid, you know? <laughs> and so that I really re- respected about this movie. Um, I like the twist, but I did think it was a little corny. <laughs> like, did it really have to be a deaf guy? Like, couldn't it just been a, a guy trying to do the right thing and like not hearing him or not seeing him as he picked up the walk? Like, did it have to be this like, Oh, he was deaf, and that was why. Like, I don't know. It seemed a little silly. Um, and then I thought it was fun and also a little silly that the senseless act was the racial profiling and the guy's reaction to it. But I don't know. It was a little on the nose. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah. But, I was you know. thinking, like, this is, so, you know, a clever sketch, you know, of a film. It wasn't, I didn't really think it felt like a short film. But then the mm. music made it feel like it was striving for for more depth and more meaning and kind of fishing for that. that that's how I interpret it. So I think corny was a really good word to describe it. I thought technically the filmmaking was really good. And I was looking at David's YouTube page and he's done a lot of shorts and videos. And like, I think he's really like, he's a storyteller, but this felt, yeah, this felt like it was reaching for something and it felt dated and it felt a little mm-hmm. too, obvious i guess this whole thing. Mm-hmm. but um i have a question i don't know i think i'll reckon know the answer to this it, the visual quality like i would say technically it's really good storytelling but i'm talking about like the way it was shot camera movement editorial you know like the blocking production design like it felt finessed but the actual video file felt like it was compressed poorly or there's something Mm. off about the visual quality and i didn't know if you could tell me what that was or if maybe i'm just uh, grasping at straws here huh yeah i should watch it again on full screen to really uh you know know for sure and maybe i I I defaulted to the lowest res and maybe that's what my my issue right i also watch it on my not good monitor (laughs) so yeah it's it's at oh it's only 480 he doesn't have it uploaded at 1080. Then that's what it was. So like ah, I thought it was a heck, default dude? on my end. But yeah, it's like <laughs> this either was dated and this was an older piece and was just, I mean, but four years ago in 2017, you would still be working in high res material. Oh, yeah, definitely. So yeah, Unless I would this say. This like 2008. That's like the only. <laughs> yeah. So know? unsolicited advice, I would say, is that if you're going to put it up online, put it up at the you know, the best compression that you can for the smallest data size or whatever that ratio yeah. is. No, because it looks well lit and it looks like they actually shot it with a real camera and everything. So there's no reason why it should be 480. That's right. weird. David, what? Dave, Why, David. What the hell? What's going on here? <laughs> um, also, one other thing that's technical that really, really bugged the shit out of me about this movie is that it's four, four minutes and 16 seconds long and it's says a three minute short film but there's like at least a minute of uh credits and then there's like 10 seconds of black at the end or something. like what are you doing David. <laughs> like, cut the damn thing off at like when the movie ends your logo end you don't even have to fade to black just end on your logo you don't need what's this 10 seconds and then why is the credits like a third of the movie length what the hell yeah. like Give us at least if you have to, if you want them to be long to thank everybody, thirty seconds maximum. You can't go back over thirty seconds. It could be fifteen seconds. I hundred like, percent really. agree with you. I mean, I think we're used to 
I mean, you look at TV and the way they completely disrespect credits and they just flash it in front of you while they start the new program. You know, no one else watches TV. I guess I'm the only one who actually watches TV. (laughs) But like they totally disrespect credits in television right now. Right. But it's like this is I think short films go the other direction where they're just like way too slow and laborious. And it's like no one is watching a short film for the credits. Put your credits in your description. That's where the credits should go. Like you can you can have them in the movie, fine, but don't make us watch them for a minute. I mean, and by God, not longer than a minute. I mean, it shouldn't and be like if it's twenty five percent or yeah, or thirty three percent of your right. Of your film. Exactly, it gotta be concise, you know. And that's something I learned like while screening at film festivals. It's like you have to keep them short to keep the, the program moving. But I think it's just a thing that you should just do no matter what. Where if you're not even gonna go to festivals, just make your credits short. It can't be that long. It's got to be like, yeah, short. If you if you're if you're watching the YouTube, I just made the short sign with my <laughs> hands. Um, anyways, I'll, overall, I think a very good effort, and I mean an entertaining movie. I think you know, but yeah, I don't know. Like you're you're you called it dated. It's very dated. Yeah. Like how mad this guy gets is like, oh yeah, it's a black guy. It's like really dude (laughs) but at least he said it like i was like i think sometimes we dance around these kind of like you know investigations into race i was like well at least you know at least this character was blatant and racist enough (laughs) to say the racist thing out loud right but he said it with like so much anger and like you know like like hate behind it it's like like really yeah (laughs) Is that is that? I mean, I guess you're frustrated, but I mean, I don't know. Anyways, um, but yeah, no, good. I, I'm curious what other people think. Like, do you guys agree with us, or do you feel like this is spot on, or do you feel like yeah, there's some issues here? We'd love to know. I know Gary's gonna tell us, so at least he'll yeah, tell us. Gary, <laughs> Gary Kennedy, let us know how you feel and email us at <laughs> podcast at making movies is hard dot com. Um, all right, we have something special this this episode. It's a special soap dish from friend of the show, Jeff Ryan, a filmmaker who recently released his feature, Youth Men, which is his first feature. And let's hear from him some tips on how to make movies. I'm Lori Craven and I'm an actress. An actress, really? How nice for you. I'm Betsy Faye Sharon and I'm a bitch. What's going on everyone? My name is Jeff Ryan and I'm a director and I'm here to give you five reasons why you should consider making small movies. Reason number one, money. I think you actually stand a chance at making money if you keep your movies small. And I mean small, like probably not paying everyone on set, which is horrible, but I think if you actually make a small movie, you stand a chance at actually turning a profit and paying those people later. Number two, I think you should self-distribute at least a portion of your rights to that movie. I think you should make a movie for a niche audience in a genre because you stand your best chance of actually targeting all your marketing efforts to that audience. One thing to consider is keeping TVOD rights. A lot of people dismiss TVOD as a way to lose money by putting your film out on Amazon, iTunes, and other transactional platforms. But we've actually seen great profit from doing that for small movies. Number three, marketing. I think you can relate to an audience in a way that other bigger movies can't. And if you make your movie for a niche subculture of some sort or fit into some genre of some sort, your marketing efforts can target them specifically, therefore making people champions of your movie. An example, our movie Youth Men is a mockumentary about youth pastors. All our marketing efforts have been creating characters on Instagram that post regularly, not about the movie, just about being a bad youth pastor. And it's very fun, it's funny, it's engaging, and people find ways to relate to that, and through that, they find out about our movie. Number four, and I'm a hypocrite because I live in New York, but get out of New York and get out of LA to make a movie. It's easy to get roped up into New York and LA's culture and you want to make a movie bigger and better, but I can say for the past two movies, we've left New York and been able to find people who are excited. The key is to get on your feet. I think we call people, we email people and expect them to give us things for free. We've learned firsthand that you need to actually go into a place, meet someone face to face, Show them that you're a nice person. Show them that you are someone who has no money, who has just an excitement for making a movie in their location with their crew and doors open. And number five, this one stinks. I hate it so much, but I think you need to do every single job on set 
or at least know every single job on set. And by keeping a movie small, I mean small. My first feature film was made for $10,000. I've done every single job on that set, and I wouldn't trade it for the world because I understand a little bit about every job. I think we can all agree that finding the money is one of the hardest things when it comes to making a movie without big stars attached. So the more jobs you can do and take on that burden, the less you have to be reliant on people with money. That's it. That's my five tips. Now my shameless plug is going to be that you please go buy and rent and review my new film, Youth Men, a mockumentary. I'm one of the directors. My co-director, Ariel, is awesome. It's so funny. It's really a labor of love. We made it for $10,000. The movie's doing really well. It's getting really good reviews. And it's available on iTunes and Amazon April 28th. Thank you so much. I love you forever. This podcast rules. I love it. Thank you so much. Jeff just released his first feature, Youth Mint, and we shall support it by renting it and purchasing it where you rent and purchase films across the universe. And just look up Jeff Ryan or Youth Men, Y-O-U-T-H-M-I-N, short for Youth Minister. Awesome. And uh, I wanted to say something about this because I watched his responses. I don't know if you watched no. them. Did you watch? No. So he gave a lot of good t- points. One of the things he said, <laughs> I think it was his first or second tip, was to not pay your crew when you're making your low-budget feature. And I was like, well, that's very controversial advice there, Jeff. Um, like, I get it. Like, you know, like, yeah, we don't have any money. And, like, you know, there is a world where – like making a movie with your friends and everyone's like chipping in and doing it for free, like feels fun and exciting and it's cool and it's worth it for everybody, you know, but there's also, I think that situation is very specific, you know, and it's like based on your relationships with those people and their desires and goals and your desires and goals, you know, I think it all, they all need to be in alignment in order for that to feel not icky but if you're like reaching out to people like who you don't know and like you're trying to get them to work for free on your movie like mm, i don't know man especially if it's like an ac or a sound person or a a pa it's like really bro like you're gonna ask this person to work for free like it's gotta be like a mutual gain you know yes that's the key it's like if you are exchanging free labor for their free labor, then I'm like 100% supportive of it, actually. Or if they're sure. getting a piece of the revenue on the back end or in its real revenue, like just monopoly money, but it's like an actual film that like the producer and director are going to work hard to release and build an audience for. You know, it's like not just like, yeah, we'll just give you some points on the back end. Uh, I don't <laughs> even know. That's like wasn't... Spence, like it was no one who was who was the not that wasn't Cagney. I don't know who that was. Um, it was almost Edward G. Robinson, but not quite. It was like halfway to Edward G. Robinson, yeah. but not. But it was not like there. Russian Edward G. Robinson. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess I get, it's like weird. I'm like coming to Jeff's defense for some reason, just because I really like him. Uh, but I do agree. We don't want to like encourage people to take advantage of labor. Like that's yeah. I'm on board with that um, criticism. I just think it's like, you know, if the person, it's like their very first movie, they want experience, like you have experience, you've been around the block, you know how to make a movie and you're giving them that guidance, like that might be helpful. Or like if you have connections to get them actual paid work after this Mm -hmm. that you can like exchange, like that might be like worth it too and like a good natural thing. Or if it's like some kind of like mutual thing where the person is like excited to do it and feels like they're getting something out of the experience. But if it's not that, then, you know, it's like, I don't know, dude. I mean, that's a, that's a big ask, you know, and that's no matter what, what department. And that's what we're trying to do with the incubator, which I know we haven't talked about for a while, but it's like, how can you reduce costs but not reduce rates? Like, is there something else right. you can take out of your budget in order to, like, not – ask for volunteer laborers all the time, which I am certainly <laughs> culpable for doing. And I have worked with volunteer laborers uh, at, on every project that I've ever done. So um, I am a glass house throwing a stone. Yeah, no, I've, I've done it too. And I mean, I've done it for shorts. I've done it. Ew, they had free people working for free on the feature. Um, it, it generally came from another department head, though. It wasn't like me personally asking. It was yeah. like, oh, like we can get some interns in because like, you know, these guys haven't worked on a big movie before. They want to work on movies. Like we've got a big set, we've got a big crew, we've got a lot of gear, you know, you got professional everything like this will feel real to them, you know? Um, so that was sort of like the trade off. Um, I still, 
like don't necessarily know if that's the best like i feel like we could just get it done with less people you know Maybe. but um I don't know. I, I think it's it's definitely a give and take thing. But um, but yeah, thank you, Jeff, for the tips. I mean, I feel like they were all good, even that one. So um, <laughs> it's always good to hear perspective from people of like how they're doing it. It's like it's all juice for the I don't know smoothie that is knowledge of filmmaking. God, terrible, <laughs> terrible. Um, <laughs> but uh, hey, Liz, guess what? What? You've got mail. My breath catches in my chest until I hear three little words. You got mail. Um, yeah, okay, we have mail. And I'm really excited, Alric. You know I've been talking about this for months. You've been talking about this for months. We've been just hoping that a new iTunes review would come in, and it has. Our prayers, our, my agnostic prayers have been answered. Um, I don't know what your faith <laughs> is, so I'm not going to presume anything, but I am agnostic. Okay, anyway. Um... I'm going to read it because I'm just so thrilled. Vibe easy, get buckets, which is second in the running to all the dead boys in terms of favorite usernames, gave us five stars. And they said, host Liz and Alric provide inspiration, humor, and fellowship filled with great interviews, guests, and perspectives. Making movies is hard as a must listen. Do you know this person, Alric? Is this potentially a stranger who wrote... This is potentially a stranger. Um, I love the name because it's like, it's a basketball reference. Oh, I didn't know what like that is. And it's like a chill reference. You vibe know, it's like, <gasps> yeah, oh, five easy, get baskets. buckets. Like, okay. Boom. Yeah. So that was, that's cool. Um, but yeah, thank you, Vibe Easy Get Buckets for the wonderful review. And um, maybe I do know this person. Uh, I do know people who like basketball. So uh, <laughs> could be somebody I know. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. But either way, thank you so much. This could be a stranger. I'm just celebrating that for a second. Just in <laughs> um, Oh, we also have a new YouTube comment on our Larry Fessenden episode. Gary Kennedy, <laughs> friend of the show, Gary Kennedy said, critiquing crowdsourcing pitch videos is an interesting new addition to the show. Something I've never seen before and will probably be, uh, and will probably be really helpful to quite a few people. Um, so thank you, Gary Kennedy, for letting us know how you feel. And I don't know if we have it in us to do this all, all the time, but um, good to know that it was useful to potentially someone, maybe Gary. Yeah, I uh, I kind of wish we had been more like like critique the other one that we had on um, like six months ago right. or whatever it was, um, because. You know, I think at the time we were like, oh, they, they, I don't know. I was like, ah, maybe that's not the right thing to do. Maybe we just let it be and like let him talk and let him have his moment, you know. But um, this time, I don't know what I don't know why. <laughs> I just felt like the right thing to do. Um, and not to say that the other one didn't deserve equal criticisms. And they actually, I don't think they even made their goal. Um, but anyways, um, you know, if we do it again, we'll definitely critique them because I thought it was fun. And, you know, they didn't seem to hate us so much. They seemed to appreciate it. They were so that really was good. sweet. Yeah. Like the yeah. people who just like were on the receiving end of us breaking down their crowdfunding campaigns. They were like just so kind. But that video he did was great. It was perfect. It was exactly what I wanted. It felt really emotional. It felt like he was speaking from the heart. It gave the information I was missing. Um, I didn't check to see if he added it to his, um, you know, his crowdfunding campaign. But I really hope he did because that is like somebody who would be potentially putting my money in. That was what I wanted to see, and that would that tipped me over into giving him money. I tried to. My card was not updated, but I will do it. <laughs> I swear to God. I am going to donate to this campaign. To My Anyways. Monster and I, just to refresh, the My yes. Monster and I campaign. My Monster and I by, um, gosh, well, he had the best name in the world. What's his name again? Um, Starzak, AJ Starzak. Oh, man, what a great name that is. Um, so go support AJ and uh, his producer, Samantha. Um, yeah, definitely cool, cool project. But... If you want to get reach out to us, there are so many ways that you can do that, including writing a YouTube comment like our good friend Gary Kennedy, um, which is done on our YouTube page, or you can support the show on Patreon uh, at www.patreon.com slash podcast, and you can give what you can. A dollar would be fantastic. We just got a new dollar last week. Thank you, thank you. Um, and if you want, you can send us a question, comment, or suggestion to podcast at makingmoviesisheart.com. Or if you really like the show, like Vibe Easy Got Buckets, you can leave us a review on iTunes or any of the places you can leave reviews for podcasts. 
Uh, and finally, check us out on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at MMIH Podcast. And again, our YouTube is Making Movies Hard Podcast, 216 subscribers. Bam. Amazing. Well, thank you to everyone for listening. Thanks to Andrew Carlberg for making this episode happen. Check out our website, makingmoviesishard.com, where you can find links to the things we talked about in this episode. Thank you to editor Cameron Caves, question mark. Cameron Caves, Probably. hero, hero yeah. of our podcast, um, for doing the editing. And uh, thank you, as always, to Lucas Kalshaw for the art. And uh, again, thank you to everyone. I'm just saying thank you a lot. Thank you to everyone for listening and talk to you all next week. <laughs>